Hi, my name is Amelia Miller. I'm a Tufts IGL sophomore majoring in international relations and Arabic. Today I'm interviewing Lauren Millard, another Tufts IGL alum. Lauren Millard is a director of programs at DreamUp where she believes that a learner's early educational experiences can make or break their pathway to a STEM career. Lauren works with a range of international space agencies and focuses on expanding access to space-based educational opportunities, including microgravity experiments and the DreamKit and DreamCoder project lines. So, hi Lauren. <laughs> hi. Um, so we were hoping to start off, could you just tell us a little bit about the work you do? Like, what does a normal day look like? Sure, yeah. So, um, first of all, thanks so much for interviewing me. Um, apologies for being obviously on the road and in the car, making a little bit of a trip today. I'm not driving, so. Um, but really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so, as you mentioned, I'm director of programs for a company called DreamUp, and so we are a small company. I'm based in Washington, D.C. My boss is actually based in Abu Dhabi um, in the UAE. So we're a small company that works around the world. Like you said in your intro to expand opportunities in the international station. So um, we, we work with educational organizations, um, students directly, who all do cool things in space. Um, so because we're so small, my day-to-day -day is, is pretty varied, um, but a lot of what I do is kind of managing our contracts and our programs generally. So we've got um, everything from contracts with space agencies. We've worked with the UAE Space Agency, for example, on a kind of multifaceted contract in which we've um, allowed or provided the opportunity for university students to do research on the space station. So everything from kind of that level to um, overseeing the development of STEM science kits that you could buy on our website or on Amazon that let you replicate an experiment to the space station. So really a lot of what I end up doing is having a lot of calls with my customers, suppliers, um, colleagues, you know, around the world, ensuring that kind of all these programs are running smoothly, contracts are being implemented the way they're supposed to, um, sometimes getting to talk, you know, directly with, with students that are working with us around the world, which is honestly my favorite part <laughs> of the job a lot of the times. Um, and yeah, kind of just making sure that all the wheels are turning. So I think a lot of people don't even realize that this is an option in international relations. <laughs> so how did you get involved in this field? That's a great question. And honestly, I never would have thought that I was here when I graduated. Um, so I'll kind of give a little bit of a picture of my journey since I graduated, if, if that's okay. Um, so I graduated in 2012 as an IR major with a concentration in international security. Um, and I actually ended up basically as my first job out of college working for Boston Public Schools in community engagement for the school district. So I was doing um, partnership building and community engagement work around, you know, school district policy, which that wasn't even exactly where I thought I would be when I graduated, but it ended up being something that I found really interesting and fulfilling and and actually, it was actually an interesting application of international relations in a lot of ways because there was a lot of politics and a lot of people I was working with from a lot of different places. Um, but after, I ended up actually staying there for five years. Um, but after about five years, I was like, this is, I'm, I'm ready for a new challenge and a new opportunity. And, you know, I've been kind of in this government role now for a while and I'm interested in working somewhere a little bit more entrepreneurial. So I kind of had that in the back of my mind, but wasn't um, necessarily actively looking for something new. But then I had a friend of mine who was my ethic classmate, um, Catherine Munson, who had started working for this um, at the time. She was working for this company called Spire, which um, uh, she could say a whole lot better than mine. So you should look up Spire instead of relying on what I say, but they, they, um, do you work in satellite technology and, and small satellites? And so she um, had met my former boss at a rocket launch, heard that my former boss wanted to hire somebody uh, to run educational programs for the company. And, you know, I happened to just kind of see her share the posting on social media. And I was like, this seems really cool. I think I'm like super well suited for this. Um, I've been building partnerships for years and I've been looking for something more entrepreneurial and like 
the idea of getting to provide this opportunity for students that could be really hands-on, where students can you know, do experiments on the space station, like that sounds awesome. Um, sign me up. So I, I basically was introduced to the company through my friend and found this job and kind of fell into this industry, which is super, um, I should say, like it's a super global industry. Um, you know, most of the companies I work with are multinational, like we really work all around the world. So there's been a very interesting kind of convergence, I think, of a lot of what I studied and a lot of my interests and then a lot of the skills that I built through my career prior to, to joining the company. So international relations is obviously a very interdisciplinary field, but I think a lot of people don't realize that STEM can be a part of that. Could you talk a little bit about the intersection of STEM and international relations in a field like this? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, it, it's interesting because when we do our projects with, with schools, we really try to emphasize with schools you know, that are doing science experiments in the space station that there's a lot more to doing a science experiment than just science. Um, and there's a lot more to working in the space industry than just being an engineer or, you know, and I even, I like to share my background as part of that. I mean, I came to the space industry through having an international relations major, um, you know, degree and working in education and now I'm here. Um, and so I, I always like to emphasize their students that, you know, even though they're, they're doing STEM, like you, there's importance in being a good communicator. There's importance in, you know, having these other kinds of skills. Um, I think that the, there's a lot more intersections of international relations and STEM in the same way than you would imagine. I mean, there's, um, the woman who runs the NASA office for interagency, you know, interspace agency affairs, basically. For you know, scientific agencies. So there's, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of importance in, in being multidisciplinary, um, which is also something I think, you know, international relations prepares you very well for. Um, and then obviously, obviously the world is in a state of chaos right now. Um, and COVID-19 has affected a lot of industries. But could you talk specifically about how COVID-19 has affected the commercial space industry? And how has space education changed now that things are over Zoom? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, too. I, so, I mean, the most immediate thing that happened obviously it was that all of a sudden I went from working in an office with a handful of colleagues every day to working from my kitchen table um, and you know that was a little bit of an adjustment I would say you know in my industry and in my work because I work with so many people around the world a lot of my days being on calls and you know being on zoom calls so that didn't actually change that much except I you know could do it from two feet from my bedroom um, of course, though, when we're providing educational services and a lot of those educational services are delivered in a classroom, you know, that changes a little bit when kids are learning from home. Um, and so, but there actually was kind of a silver lining in that for us because there, there was actually um, a lot of push for providing resources for parents and families, you know, immediately at the beginning of the pandemic in the spring um, that could be used at home very easily. And so we actually ended up featured in an article on CNN's website, for example, about space education resources that parents can use right now, you know, as their kids are learning from home. So in some ways it became um, almost an ideal opportunity to promote what we had because a lot of times space education doesn't even fit that well into a standard curriculum. We're kind of doing this interdisciplinary, like funky thing that often is in extracurricular anyway, so it almost became an opportunity to like bring this into a kid's day-to-day -day, um, learning when they're at home because they aren't in the every day. Um, we also, my sister company basically in uh, Italy to provide um, programming for students in Italy as they learn from home. 
um, thanks to support from the European Space Agency. So the European Space Agency at the outbreak of the pandemic was looking for ways to support um, Italian students impacted having to learn from home. And they said, you know, how can we use the resources that we have on the International Space Station uh, to support students? And we actually had a product that we were like, I think this is a great fit. Um, and the product is a curriculum and a program that allows students to actually learn how to kind of do computer engineering and then write code, send it to the space station where it's executed and then get data back. Um, so they're learning new skills, learning really interdisciplinary and computer engineering skills, and they're using this asset on the space station. And it's an online curriculum that they could, you know, we can easily adapt for the home setting. And so we saw this, you know, kind of great opportunity and ESA um, thought it was worthy of funding and the European Space Agency thought it was worthy of funding. And so, you know, we kind of ended up with some of these new opportunities as um, things have evolved. I should say, you know, there's other contracts and things that we had that did get delayed. Um, we are fortunate though, like I said, that we're adaptable and a lot of our customers are adaptable. Um, the space station is still up and running and there's astronauts that are still there that need supplies and are still working so it's it's been a it's part of critical infrastructure um and in that way you know the schedule has kind of kept moving in terms of all the things we need to prepare so for the commercial space industry that i've seen um generally it hasn't had as dramatic of an impact as i think other industries have have seen because a lot of space at least in the united states if not around the world is kind of categorize as critical infrastructure um, for a lot of countries. So, I mean, if you follow the news of like SpaceX and those kinds of companies, they're still doing tons of launches. They're still, you know, SpaceX is launching its Starlink network. Um, so there's still a lot happening in the commercial space industry. Um, I think there, you know, there was a few companies that were hit hard, but for the most part, um, people have been chugging along. And along with this idea of space education, what early learning experiences do you think can encourage young children to pursue a career in STEM? Yeah, I think that's, answering that question is what got me into this job. Um, and I'll kind of deviate a little bit, but you know, I when I was in Boston Public Schools, I worked in, you know, I guess in some ways textbook, like high-risk neighborhoods. I worked with a lot of kids of color, a lot of immigrant kids, a lot of kids whose first language is in English, um, kids, you know, who were economically disadvantaged. And so, you know, I, I ended up working a lot in um, helping to build a new building for a STEM school in Roxbury. And, you know, I saw this potential for this, like, really awesome resource in Roxbury, but there was this really beautiful school where these kids have a tailored STEM program that there was a gap between even, even with the school and with this building and with these resources, there's a little bit of a gap between, you know, learning in school and actually like doing something hands-on or even having role models to look to in STEM fields. So it became apparent to me that, you know, by giving kids the opportunity to do something hands-on and, and real, like kids, you know, through our programs and other programs like ours are able to do real experiments that they send to the space station using the same equipment and same materials that a researcher could use a professional researcher, academic researcher could use. And, um, you know, those are the kinds of opportunities I wanted to provide to the kinds of kids I used to work with back at, you know, the STEM school that I was helping to, to get rebuilt. Um, and so to more directly answer your question, the, the things that I think are most critical is providing, you know, hands-on, project-based opportunities at the right times for students to get them interested and excited um, about STEM. And all the research shows that the perfect age to do this is kind of middle school age, you know, 12 to 14 years old. This is where students really start to self-identify. This is where we lose girls. This is where we lose, you know, students of color. Like this is where we lose a lot of the students who don't have um, role models and don't really understand how they could pursue a STEM course or career. Um, and by, and, by giving them a project, so that's when I talk about project-based learning, it's you know a delivery model of education that allows students to explore um, a broad. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a call. Um, okay, can you see me? <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> the disadvantages of being on your phone. Um, so, 
so by giving students the opportunity to explore a project that's multidisciplinary, they're also able to kind of explore things that are interesting to them. And that's also very important in, in sparking their curiosity about STEM because that way they can actually do something they find interesting and neat and explore it and kind of spark their wonder rather than you know, just learning math or learning you know, science facts in the classroom. Um, and so those are, that's what's critical. And then shifting gears a little bit, do you believe the STEM field and more specifically the study of space and astronomy actively encourage women in the field? Um, and if not, what steps do you think can be taken to make STEM more inclusive? Um, I think bright spots and there's some people that I look up to in the industry. Um, there's a woman, for example, named Emily Calandrelli who is kind of named, nicknamed the Space Gal. And she just released a television show called um, Emily's Wonder Lab on Netflix. And it's, it's a kid's show. It's like in the vein of, you know, Bill Nye the Science Guy or some of the things that, you know, I grew up with. Um, except it's a woman, you know, doing the show, showing that she could be a woman scientist, you know, get kids excited about science. Um, and even better, when she filmed the show, she was like eight months pregnant. So she was showing these kids, you know, like, it, and, and it's just, that's who she is on the show. She's a woman who's pregnant and, you know, doing science, getting kids about science, you know, showing that there's um, space for, for people like her to, you know, young girls and things like she's doing. That said, of course, we own the industry. Um, and so I think, you know, there's more to be done to provide pathways um, for people to, to get mentorships and, and um, get into careers. I mean, further down the line, there's, there's fellowships and programs um, for, there's a Brooke Owens Fellowship, which is a um, fellowship for women to work and intern in commercial space companies. Um, and I, there's actually a new program, and now I don't remember the name, but my boss is actually a, a mentor for it. Um, but after... Um, Black Lives Matter protests and things like that this summer, um, the space industry realized there was a little bit of a need for something like that for, for Black students um, to provide pathways for them into the commercial space industry as well. And so there's a new fellowship there. And so I think those kinds of programs, like, and replicating those kinds of successful models is really important because not only are they providing a pathway, but they also provide mentorship, you know, so people can understand, like, how do I get in and then learn from a mentor, like, what do I do now and how do I stay engaged in this industry? Um, yeah, and I guess and your question specifically was about women, but I mean, I think it's, it's intersectional as well. So. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, um, the intersectionality of the field. And then I suppose more broadly, where do you see the commercial space industry going? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's huge. It's huge and it's booming and I never even knew the, the kind of role that I'm in like I said that I would even be in it or that it even existed you know that I could work in a company that provides space-based opportunities to students and what's even more amazing is that there's other people other companies and nonprofits like mine that exist um, and so I see I see more honestly so there's a lot of talk um, where I work about um, what the future of the International Space Station looks like. And, you know, the International Space Station has only been certified to a certain date, which is not too far off into the future. So we're gonna see the rise of commercial space, actually. There's companies um, like Axiom Space and others that are developing commercial space stations. Um, our sister company, Nanorax, is developing commercial platforms for, for space. And so we're gonna see more private actually by space agencies anymore and often actually space agencies are going to become the customer of commercial space. This is something that um, Nanorax talks about all the time. That's, they were one of the pioneers here. Um, and so that's, that's really where I, if there's going to be a shift and there already has been a big shift between, you know, the role of, of commercial actors and space agencies for sure. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, there's been all these kind of startups up and coming. So I think it'll also be interesting to see how they kind of grow and mature and align and become established, um, especially in, you know, the small satellite industry and, and things like that, that have really boomed and, and exploded over the last few years. 
And then finally, another more general question. For those who are interested in possibly pursuing a career in the industry, what do you think is the future of international relations in space? Huh, that's a great question. I mean, it is, there's, in some ways, it's kind of like the Wild West. You know, there's um, some fundamental space law, but not much more than that. And so there's still a lot of um, international negotiation and international cooperation, um, competition. You know, there's a lot of things that are, that are happening and will continue to happen. I mean, there's, I'm not a, a space lawyer, but there's a lot of talk about, around space lawyers about, you know, kind of how we need to update policy because it, it hasn't caught up to things like the small sat revolution um, or, you know, to, to how commercial space is acting. So I think for, for folks that are interested in, you know, the intersections of policy and international relations and, and space, there's a lot of room to get into some really interesting things there. Um, there's an interesting program even at George Washington University. They do a master's in space policy, for example. Um, that, you know, deals with a lot of those issues. Um, and I think even on the commercial side, I mean, I have the privilege of working with, um, you know, the European Space Agency, the UAE Space Agency, um, organizations in Kuwait, Thailand, you know, Hong Kong, like all, all around. And um, so I think there's, there's also a lot of pathways for international relations through, through commercial space as well. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, for agreeing to do this interview today. It was really informative and interesting, um, and I'm sure it'll be really beneficial for a lot of people who are interested in a career in space. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah. Sorry that I had to be in the car to do it, but you know, <laughs> it's COVID, I guess, and my office is almost anywhere. So, um, yeah. So thanks so much. And I mean, if, if students want to look me up or reach out to me, you know, I'm happy to kind of provide guidance how I can. Thank you so much.